The Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra presents Wagner's Ring Cycle, Part 3, Siegfried. <laughs> and welcome back to The Ring Cycle, presented by the Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra. And this podcast is intended to be heard before you go into the hall and listen to Act One of Siegfried, the third part of The Ring. And I'm joined once again by Sue Elliott, our wonderful visiting expert, to talk a little bit about what we're going to hear in the hall. So Sue, welcome back to Hong Kong. Thanks so much, Raf. It's great to be back. Tell us a little bit about Siegfried and, and, and the sort of setup that we get in the in the first say five minutes of this of this opera because it's a very different opening from well from either Rheingold or from Valkura. I think that's true, and uh, one way to look at it actually is that when Siegfried opens, in some respects, I think the audience can feel a great sense of relief because it moves very quickly at the beginning. Um, this is a very a comedic type first act. It's not all fun and games. There's definitely serious information conveyed, but it moves very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of text coming at us, um, and there's a lot of action as well. So it's it's the start of a fairy tale, actually, and we really haven't had that this thus far in the ring. Yeah, and we, we also are meeting, of course, uh, two brand, well, almost new characters. Mima, I'm fascinated by this, this character because he, in the Rheingold, is one of uh, 14 or 15 characters. And he has almost nothing to do in that opera, or not, not, a, not a great deal anyway. But here, suddenly, it's a, it's a huge role, isn't it? This Mima character is, is really driving the story. It's absolutely true. And what's interesting, if you trace the way the character of Mima developed as Wagner was creating this opera, that the character actually changed quite a bit during the creative process. He was nicer, he was more caring, um, and what we actually see in the, the final version that's performed by the Hong Kong Philharmonic is that Mima lies a lot, he's deceitful, he's manipulative, and quite frankly, the only reason uh, he does what he is doing, which is raising our hero du jour, Siegfried, from the time he was a baby, is to actually use him for uh, more evil ends, if you will, uh, coming up in Act Two. So there's nothing charitable about Mima's uh, work in helping raise Siegfried. And certainly the first scene of Act One, we see the dynamics of that relationship play out quite strongly. It's clear that Siegfried has no love for Mima. Um, and it's also clear that Mima has not really told Siegfried very much about his origins. So Siegfried has to constantly question him for everything that he wants to know. And we also see a lovely contrast. I think it's hard to like Siegfried at first. Uh, he comes on stage with a bear. Are you having a bear here on stage at the Cultural Center? Um, we didn't book a bear, I'm sorry to say. Fair enough. Um, it's a non-speaking role, so... <laughs> audience will have to imagine the bear. It's um, true, but the bear comes on stage in part to help demonstrate that Siegfried has no fear. And of course, Mima cowers in fear when the bear appears with Siegfried. And when Siegfried comes rushing on stage, it's full of energy. It's absolute. He's uncontainable. Um, and and we see that there's this. Uh, it's just not a healthy relationship. Let's let's put it that way. Yeah, I think uh, audience members should probably brace for some quite nasty dialogue. Actually, they really they really uh, don't get along. Well, Siegfried certainly has not much time for Mima, um, and Mima, as you say, is kind of creating this uh, creating this plot. We hear a lot of kind of what's going to happen shortly. Um, but tell us a bit more about Siegfried, because I I, I saw in the notes you gave me a very interesting comment about how how difficult it can be to like this character. Firstly, because we, um, we think we see the tenor and we think of a grown man, or at least a young man, um, saying these things. But actually, this character is younger again than that. It's true. He's a teenager. And not only is he a teenager with all that comes with that, right? When, for those of you who are parents or grandparents know, You'll, you'll remember the boisterousness, the brooding nature of teenagers, the impetuous nature. And we absolutely see that in Siegfried in the first scene of Act One. It's really important to understand that Siegfried has only ever known Mima. That's the only other human he's known. Mm. And it's not a great example. 
And he's been without social contact. So he's really grown up in nature. And when Siegfried sings about the beasts that he knows from the forest, um, he completely changes. And we get some moments of incredible beauty that are a lovely contrast to all of that energetic, boisterous, um, perhaps out of control, though, of course, when Simon sings it, it, it is absolutely controlled. Um, but there is some nice contrast there. You just have to, to pay attention to it. Mm. Um, and so, so he's often misunderstood in that way. He's, he's never known parents, never experienced a nurturing kind of love, and he's had to rely on his own instinct to survive. Mm. And then the third character in this first act um, is someone we, we do know very well, although not under the same name. It's true. This is Wotan, from, who we know well from Das Rheingold and Die Valkyra, but he appears in this opera in his wanderer persona. Um, and what's interesting, again, if you go back and look at the early versions of the Siegfried opera story, Wotan or the Wanderer did not factor at all. It was merely about the life of young Siegfried growing up. But Wagner needed to find a way, as the cycle expanded and developed, to integrate the human comedy of the character of Siegfried with the remainder of the ring, and that includes all of its mythological dimensions. So he brings back the Wotan, but in his persona as the wanderer. So Sue, I wanted to ask um, a question which was asked of me, and I was a bit stuck for an answer. This dialogue between the wanderer and Mima happens effectively between two strangers, although uh, wanderer knows exactly who Mima is, and, and it's clear that Mima is starting to realize who the wanderer is. But the question is about the riddles and why, why it's important that um, two characters or how two characters would come to ask riddles of one another in their first meeting. It seems like a very strange way to get to know someone. I think that's true and it not everything in, in Wagner is easily explainable. Um, the dramatic purpose for what we call this battle of wits, this competition between them, is a way for Wagner to try and make interesting and hopefully a little bit dramatic some of the backstory. Um, that has taken place earlier in the action of the cycle. Um, and the answers to Mima's first two questions involve episodes that the audience has all, have already seen in Das Rheingold. And a lot of people criticize Wagner. Why do you have to repeat that? We saw that. Well, he's actually, I don't think, repeating it just to repeat it, but to help underscore for us that Mima is not making the most of his opportunity to learn something new. He's actually asking questions to which he already knows the answers in a game of one-upsmanship, mm. if you will. Um, and the third question that Mima asks the Wanderer um, is new information for the audience. It actually takes place either before the beginning of Das Rheingold or between scenes one and two of Das Rheingold because it concerns the, the um, creation of, of Wotan's spear. And we see that first in the second scene of Das Rheingold. Terrific. And the spear, of course, leads us to the other weapon that we're going to see right, right now, and that's the broken sword. Tell us a bit about that. We have seen it before, of course, in the tree, and then, and then, and then shattered when Sigmund died in, uh, in Act 2 of Die Valkura. But here are the pieces. Here are the pieces. Mima has stolen this from Sieglinde. Um, at the time she gives birth to Siegfried. Um, and what's interesting about this is that the sword helps show the audience two different examples or approaches to forging something, and that has sort of iconic resonance. We see Mima trying to patch it together um, with solder in the first scene of Act One, and he's not successful. And Siegfried is, of course, very frustrated, and uh, Wagner has Siegfried demonstrate his great strength because he keeps breaking all the swords that Mima tries to make for him. In the third scene of Act One, when Siegfried comes back on stage after the Battle of Wits, Siegfried tries a different approach. He files down the fragments and reforges Notung, the fragments of Notung, on his own. And the reason why this is so clever on Wagner's part is that Siegfried is forging his own path to this freedom or his manhood rather than simply accepting a sword that someone else has built for him. And this also differs from Siegfried's father, Siegmund, who pulls the sword out of the tree in Die Valkyra, thereby accepting a sword from someone else. And we know that for our hero theoretically to be 
successful in the quest that Wotan has set for him, that he has to be independent of the gods. And so that's why it's really important that Siegfried figures out, uses his natural instinct to forge Notung on its own. And um, of course, that's going to send us on the trajectory of this character. I must say, and I find he's a bit of a jerk about it, uh, considering that Mima is the expert, the dwarf who should be able to, you know, make brilliant things out of steel. Um, but, uh, but that's the climactic scene of this act, isn't it? And it, I think we're nearly ready to start. Yes, we are. So please, ladies and gentlemen, take your seats and we'll talk again at the end of Act One.